My name is Sandra Boyd, and I decided to come and be a part of this documentary because in 2002, I had a near-death experience, and afterwards, I had absolutely no one to talk to and had a very hard time figuring out in the beginning what had happened to me. And I feel that if there are other people out there, which I'm pretty sure there are, that are in the situation I was in, they could see this and it would help them. That was excellent. Um, okay, so then if you can just think back to before you had a near-death experience in that, that day or maybe the one or two days beforehand, how you were feeling, what was going on in your life. Sure. Um, a couple days prior to my near-death experience, I had been sick for about three months. Uh, I had some kind of a cold and then bronchitis and then um, just lung infections that wouldn't go away and hadn't really gone to the doctors to get it taken care of. And I um, woke up in the morning and had this feeling like I was dying and stayed in bed. Um, about three o'clock in the afternoon, I took off all my jewelry and I went out to the living room and said to my daughter's father at the time, I think I'm dying and you need to take me to the emergency room. And so we jumped in the car and raced to the emergency room. And the next thing I basically remember is sitting in a room with the doctors asking me why I waited so long. And then um, I started to drown in my own, my own fluids. So my lungs were filling up while the doctors actually hadn't even had a chance to get everything they needed to intubate me. And so as they were screaming and yelling that the ship is sinking, um, I remember looking down, and then I remember thinking, I'm actually looking down at the doctors working on me, and at that moment, I realized it was 5.30. I had looked at the clock and that I was out of my body, and no longer was I in any pain, and actually saw the devastational look on everybody's face, but I was feeling really good. Okay, can we back up a little bit and go to in the car? Do you remember if, if you could put your like if you have to close your eyes for a moment and think about how you felt in the car? I don't I don't mean to traumatize you, but I really want to get into the, the moment. If you can just think about that when you're on your way. To, did you you drove yourself? Then? No, my daughter's father drove me, and um, I was unable to really breathe. So the whole time going to the hospital, it was just a matter of trying to stay alive to make it because I knew that something was horribly wrong and I truly felt like I was dying. So I was scared, uh, thinking about my daughter, what was gonna happen with my daughter who was only four years old. And I um, then just kept focusing on trying to breathe. I'm trying to picture pulling up to the hospital, but a lot of that is kind of a blur. I remember pulling up to the hospital, and the next thing I remember actually is standing there telling the woman at the counter that I'm dying. So there's missing moments. You know, I don't think I waited because I think they took my blood pressure and realized that there was a huge problem. Then they brought you. They just raced me into one of the rooms where a bunch of doctors started running in. So if I remember correctly, there were like three doctors and a couple of nurses, and they were all frantic, racing around, trying to, uh, the one doctor, uh, the pulmonary specialist, um, he was um, taking different tubes and putting them down my throat because I guess he couldn't find a good fit. So I remember one being flown oh, back over his shoulder, and I saw this from above. Another doctor was yelling at him that he needed to hurry because the ship was sinking. And so I remember thinking, that's interesting. I'm not a ship. <laughs> I'm a person, but... Um, what, 
was your uh, husband at the time there? Um, yes, he wasn't my husband, but he was there and he was standing under the clock and they couldn't, they were so frantic trying to work on me that no one had asked him to leave. And so when I popped out of my body, I remember looking at him and then looking at the clock. That's how I remember that it was 530 when I died. Well, I remember that they were all very frantic and Kevin looked like he was going to pass out, but I just remember feeling really good and actually felt like I was smiling. So I, I believe that I knew that I was getting ready to go home. One more question about that moment. What did you, when you saw your body, what did your body look like? If you can describe it in detail. My body looked like, like my body now. <laughs> I looked just like this, but I was laying back. I had my eyes closed and there were doctors all over me and tubes going th into my mouth and in my nose. And they were putting lines into my arm, into my neck. But I just looked like I was sleeping. Okay, so um, when I was out of my body, and I noticed that it was 5.30, and I was listening and watching the doctors work on me. I uh, also realized that at that time, I had so much knowledge that I actually knew that there was a gentleman in a room next to me who was also dying, and he, his soul left his body and uh, went where we were going. We did not travel together. I just was aware of it. But the interesting thing is, for me, is I was aware that he was passing on and that he was going to stay passed on. Did you visually see him also in his room, or you just were aware of it? I visually saw him in his room in my mind. I could see him. I knew what he looked like on this earth, and then I also knew what he looked like in soul form. After, after focusing on the gentleman in the next room, I then just raised, just started raising up. I went through the hospital. I did not see a light. I did not go through a tunnel. I actually went through the top of the hospital and I could see earth. I could see everything. I could see the lights. I could see buildings. I could see houses. And it was almost like I took my attention somewhere else and I was, to the best way that I could describe it, I was home. So I was standing, <laughs> floating. I don't know what you want to call it. I want to say I was standing, but I doubt that I was standing um, in front of what looked to be a playground. And I saw all these children and they were playing, um, you know, some kind of a schoolyard game. And you could hear all the kids screaming and laughing and as I looked at them I realized that they were changing from the way that they looked here on earth to these little soul lights there they were just buzzing around and as I looked at them and they looked back at me I knew what their name was and what they had died from and I just was there smiling and I felt so good and you just f could feel all this love and acceptance and they were so happy they weren't nobody was saying oh I you know I, I died down on earth and now I'm here it was just like we're all home and we're playing and we're having this great time and at that moment I felt this it almost felt like a hand on my shoulder and everything stopped. I focused my attention to that hand. And um, what I got was, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. You need to come with me. <laughs> so um, 
I left that area and was directed to go to, I think, at that point to the, my board. But on my way, I was shown a room that had a soul in it. And the room was filled with really beautiful golden light. And it was filled with nothing but this love, love that we don't feel here on earth. It's an all accepting, all beautiful. And my impression was this soul was kind of sitting and he was kind of slouched over. And what I was shown was that he had done really bad things on earth and his soul was being um, conditioned and given love and try, they were trying to help him to get through what he had done down here. Do you have any like sense of why you were shown that? I mean, why you, you were able to see that? You know, I've thought about that question many of times because why would I be shown something like that? I think that I was shown that so I could help. When you're here on earth, people are always wondering, why are we here? What is our purpose? And um, you hear different people say, well, we're supposed to love each other. And that truly is the case, but it's a type of love that we humans don't really experience all that often. And I personally believe after seeing what I saw in my near-death experience that when we die, we don't go to hell. <laughs> we kind of live in hell. And when we die, we aren't judged by others and, and that we, we need, I need to be more accepting and loving towards other people also. So I think that I was shown that so I could get an idea of what that real unconditional love is. What happened after that? After that, after seeing him, and my impression is it was a him because it wasn't a man really sitting there. It was a soul who was there. And my impression was that this soul was a male soul. Um, I turned my attention to where I was really supposed to be going, which was to my board. So my board was made up of three souls. One soul felt really tall and was very, the word I'm looking for, he was uh, a very experienced soul. And then two souls, one on each side of the middle soul, um, who were talking to me about my life here on earth. And I get the sense that I was like slamming my hand on the table. It was a very business meeting and it was a, um, talking about me coming back. And at that point I was feeling like I didn't want to come back. And so they were showing me things that I had done in life and things that were still left for me to do. And one of the biggest um, things for me to do was to be here for my daughter, who at the time was only four. So after having this conversation with my board that takes place in your brain because you don't sit and talk back and forth with them, um, I was then uh, slammed back in my body. I know this is going to be really hard, but can you try to describe visually what it was like, like backing up to when you came in with your board? Like what did they look look like? I mean, it's, it's, I know it's very difficult. <sighs> Trying to describe what it's like on the other side here is very difficult because there aren't a lot of words that we humans use for what happens over there. But I can tell you that my brain <laughs> probably picked things up and tried to uh, 
say, what is the closest thing I know to what is happening? What am I seeing? So I can tell you that I feel like I saw this really, really pretty table. It was like a board, you know, it was like made out of wood. And it was very, uh, I've never really described it. It was very pretty. The woods in it were different colors. There were light woods. There were like cherry woods, but it was all made out of wood. And I stood on one side and they stood on the other side. And um, the one in the middle was, my sense is, was um, very old and very wise. And the two that stood on each side were younger and in training. So they didn't do a lot of talking to me, but they agreed with what was being said to me. You mentioned earlier that they look like beings of light. Yes. So my experience went back and forth. I saw what we look like in soul form, but I also saw what we look like here. Why do you think that is? Do you have an opinion? Well, I think I saw it that way because I was comfortable and that is the way that it is. Yeah. On the other side, we don't look like this, right. but I still carried a lot of my consciousness from being a human there, so I was able to recognize them as the humans that they were, whether they were little kids or an older man or whatever. In that moment, did you still feel the all-encompassing love? love? Yeah, that's why there was such a fight at the board, because I wasn't going to come back. I wasn't going to come back and do life. Life is hard. Life can be really tough. We don't have the um, the kind of love here on earth that we have over there. And I just wanted to stay home. I was home. I knew it was home. No doubt about I went home. And so I was, at, I was actually felt like I was being asked to leave home. I was being kicked out of my home to come back here. Now, I, I have been told, and in some cases looking back now because it has been about 10 years for me that we choose to come back but when I first came back it was very difficult for me because I felt forced. Can you, can you think of any other sensations that you felt while you were there? My experience was when I was out of body and I was on the other side, I did know. I was connected. So, you know, I knew every, I felt like I knew everything. I didn't come back remembering everything, but I did know everything. And I did feel a type of love that I've never experienced before here on earth. There's one other thing um, that I think that you mentioned to me, um, is the, and a lot of people say, is that when they're on the other side, it's actually like, more real. Right. No, you know, for me, and I, I've heard a lot of different experiences. I've talked to a lot of different people who've had experiences, and um, everybody who has an experience has their own experience. I can tell you that for me, I didn't see a lot of colors. I didn't see flowers. I didn't see butterflies. I saw... Uh, children playing at a playground, and it looked to me like a playground that we have here. I saw, you know, someone sitting in a room that probably in my brain I could have thought was like like a hospital because he was being healed. And the the color of the golden light is something that we don't have here. And the feelings that I felt are the feelings we don't have here. But as far as, you know, spectacular lighting or, you know, colors, I didn't see that. I had, in my mind, almost a very business type of experience. Two. All right. Surviving death, scene two, take two. I, so I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit about um, the first, actually the first thing that I noticed when I popped out of my body. The first thing I noticed when I popped out of my body was the sound that my soul makes. And I um, know that a lot of 
people refer to the sound our soul makes as music, but for me, it reminds me of a buzzing. And so we all actually, our souls all vibrate at a little different level. And it, to me, is a buzzing noise. And I remember just being with it and hearing myself buzzing. And um, I think I was becoming just becoming familiar again with myself after being in this shell for so long. And also when I was at the playground watching the children, I could hear them laughing and screaming, but I also could hear the vibration, the buzzing noise that each of them made, that their souls made. And just think that that's really important because it's, almost like words for us here or a recognition. I know what you look like there. I know what you sound like. And together we all vibrate and make this noise. I guess some, some people refer to it as music. For me, it's just a vibrational level. Did you notice a vibrational sound when you went into the, um, the board? Yes. But when I went in front of the board, it was very business. And so there wasn't any time to just sit there and just um, feel the love for each other. <laughs> it was uh, me sure that I was going to stay on the other side. And I think they were sure that they were going to show me why it was so important for me to come back. Speed. Speed. Surviving death. Scene three, take one. Okay, um, so now we're, you're, you just arrived back in your body. Okay, so I, um, I felt like I was slammed back into my body and it felt like the shell wasn't actually big enough to house me because on my soul form, I felt very big. And I remember um, actually Try, waking up and trying to breathe, uh, but I was on life support. And so I could hear uh, nurses yelling at me, telling me to stop. I don't, I think they were telling me to stop because I was flailing and I was trying to pull the machine out of my mouth and, um, and um, later learned, I didn't know at this time, but later I learned they had to keep inducing me into a coma. So they give you this medicine that is, uh, they said it's white and they call it um, milk of amnesia because it's supposed to keep you sedated deep enough for the machines to do your breathing. Um, and then you would not remember anything. However, the medicine that they were giving me, the mix was off. And so there were times when I was very awake, but all I was was a brain. And I just remember laying there thinking, what did I do that was so bad? Surviving death, scene three, take two. <laughs> the date of my near-death experience was May 18th, 2002. And uh, in the hospital, uh, after I had come out of the coma and my family was coming in to visit me, I asked one of them why they were so upset. And they said that the doctors told them that I wasn't going to live, that they only gave me a 10% chance to live, and that they had asked the family to call in uh, somebody from the church to pray over me. And so um, the doctors told me themselves that they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They didn't know what medicines to give me and that they felt my body almost healed itself. And that there wasn't any signs of the sickness that I had gone in there with coming out. And then they let me go home. So then we're going to talk about, we, we, are, we covered a little bit about when you first went home but to get in the flow. Let's just go sure. right back into that. Okay. When I first got home, 
I was just happy to be home. But then the reality of what had happened to me set in and that I was trying to be who I was before the coma. And it was very obvious to myself that I was no longer that person, that my belief system had changed and that my interactions with certain family members and just the public in general wasn't the same. And I was having a very tough time trying to figure out how to get my rhythm back. I was doing life just fine. I was working. I had all these relationships. I had friendships. I did what I did. And now I was like this totally different person with this whole new belief system. And some of those people I couldn't even connect with anymore. I couldn't even relate to them and found it very difficult to be around them. And my core person wasn't the same and knew I needed to make a lot of changes. So after being home and getting back on my feet after about three, four, five months, I went back to work. And soon after going back to work, I actually ended my relationship that I was in with my daughter's father. And I took my four-year-old and we moved out onto our own. And uh, just day by day, I just took it day by day and tried to get a rhythm for life again. But it was really difficult because not being able to relate to a lot of the people that I related to before. And I had all this knowledge and memory of these experiences. And I tried to talk to a couple people and um, it didn't go well. People were shutting me up. They weren't able to handle it. They said, oh, it's your imagination. Um, but I knew for sure that what I had went through wasn't my imagination. I didn't know at the time that I had a near-death experience. It wasn't until about seven months after my near-death experience, I had a call from a friend of mine who said, I didn't realize that you had been so sick and you were in the hospital, let's talk. And I said, no, I don't talk about that part of my life. And he said, why? And I said, because it doesn't seem to be accepted by people and I don't feel comfortable sharing it anymore or even trying. And so he said, well, you know what? Give me a minute and turn on your computer and look at your email. And so I waited about 15 minutes and I got on my computer and um, there was a message from him that said, it sounds like you had a typical near-death experience and that you are gonna be just fine. And so I wrote back and I said, what is the near-death experience? And he said, um, go online and look this up and just do some research. And that was all the conversation that I had. So I went online, I did some research, and I found a phone number of someone to call and um, started to deal with. I met other people who had near-death experience and started to deal with that part of reintegration after a near-death experience. At the same time, I was having a lot of health problems. And a lot of near-death experiencers have health problems after they come back. And for whatever reason, you were in a car accident, they drowned, they whatever. And I was going to the doctor, I had lots of symptoms. So now I'm back to work. I'm raising my four-year-old on my own. I'm trying to make new friends and I'm trying to integrate all this new life and I'm having strange symptoms like um, trying to walk and my feet would just fall or I had intermittent paralysis and I had moments of confusion where I didn't really know where I was and then it, I would just kind of hang out <laughs> knowing that I should know where I am and then it would hit me oh here is where I am and so I went to one doctor who said, we're going to test you. I'm sure you have MS. And so I want you to start taking these meds and go get these tests done. So you're taking these meds for MS, which cause other symptoms. You have other things that are happening. And I went for that test and that was in, in, incorrect. And I so I was sent to another specialist who 
said, oh, I know what your problem is. Here, take this med. You have this kind of brain tumor, and so you have to go for these tests. And so now I'm doing life. I'm going to work. I'm raising a four-year-old. I'm trying to integrate my near-death experience. I'm trying to figure out who I can tell that would be accepting or who I could talk to against the ones that I probably should be real quiet around because I didn't know how to stand up for or defend myself against people who were very negative towards my near-death experience. I don't have that problem anymore because I own it now. It's been enough time. I've done enough research. I know that I had a near-death experience. I know many people have had near-death experience. They exist. They're real. And they change some of our lives forever in different ways. But I finally went to a doctor who looked at everything. He looked at one of my charts and he said, I know what your problem is. You don't have MS, you don't have a brain tumor. You have some brain damage because you had loss of oxygen to your brain. And I smiled and said, thank you, because I believe that statement to be true. I resonated with it and I knew that my brain could do some rerouting and I'd learned to do some of the things that I couldn't really do very well anymore. Like if somebody gave me an address, I had a really hard time writing it down. I had a hard time making something come out of my hand that went into my brain. And I just kept practicing. I had one doctor tell me I'd never be able to work again because my brain wasn't going to function properly ever again. And so I decided to show him wrong, and I did. I do work, and um, I am just reaching out to other people who have had near-death experiences who have never trusted anybody or don't know where to go to get online and look for NDE or look for near-death experience and find that you're not the only one out there, that this has happened to a lot of us. And just get some help and keep moving forward. You know what, there's some stuff that I left out just because I was going. About four or five months after my near-death experience, I took my daughter and moved into my own place. Uh, it was about the seventh month when I learned about, I started to learn about near-death experiences, and it was my 11th month that I actually sought out a group and went for my, to my first group. About 13 months after my near-death experience, I was really being pulled to do something that was uh, more meaningful and was really starting to think about hospice work and getting into that so that I could have more heart-to-heart -heart connections in my life. And so that happened at about 13 months, and I think it was closing in around 15 or 16 months when I actually entered into a program where I started learning about end-of-life and then I became a part of that program and helping teach that two times a year at the VA hospital uh, eight years ago, nine years ago. And then through the years, were there any other milestones that you felt like you reached, um, a, either a change or a new understanding or anything? Some, I think that through the years, uh, being able to talk about my experience in different group settings and having it helped certain people be, and knowing that it did because they came back to tell me. I think each time I spoke about my experience and it helped someone, it gave me a better confidence in that this experience isn't supposed to be hidden. It is supposed to be shared. It, it helps other people to know that they're not alone in these experiences that some of us are having. Are you comfortable talking about the people in your life that aren't <clears throat> comfortable hearing about your story? Sure. I mean, if you want to. I just I know that other people face that. Like sometimes even sure. the closest people to you that you still have to be in their life aren't comfortable. Right. Well, I do share uh, my daughter with her father, and we are no longer together, but we have a cordial relationship. However, he refers to 
my experience and or the hospice work that I do as being very morbid. So that's a very harsh statement. In the very beginning of my experience, you know, coming out about my experience to have somebody tell me to my face that I'm morbid and what I've been through is morbid made me want to be more of a recluse. Um, but I just kept pushing through because I am very sure, 100% sure that the experience I had is real and that the place I went to is home and that coming back here is not home. Where I went to when I died was home and I wanted to stay home. Coming back here is more of, for a lack of better words, schooling. And so I came back to continue with the school that I have to, you know, finish. And so um, my mother doesn't believe in near-death experiences. She believes that when you die, you die. So even today, there are times when she'll make comments about my mom is um, on oxygen. She has severe emphysema and is... Um, closing in on the end of her life. And she uh, has made comments about, well, don't turn my oxygen off because I might not get enough oxygen through this tube. She has a 50 foot cord and I might have one of those uh, NDEs that you talk about. So <laughs> I can laugh about it now. In the beginning, it's pretty horrifying when your own mom doesn't believe that you had this experience. Um, but I asked my mom to do me a big favor because we do have a good relationship. We kind of agree to disagree. Um, I asked her when she passes to please, if she sees a light, go to it. <laughs> or if she feels a hand coming out to greet her, grab it and go with it. Don't hang around. <laughs> so she promised me she would. <laughs> so. Scene three, take three. We were going to go back to um, why you were searching out a specific kind of work and sort of what you went through. Sure. Um, one of the things that happened uh, to me, one of the changes, the biggest changes that I noticed is that I really wanted to start making connections with people. I felt really strongly about having heart-to-heart -heart connections and um, going back to work, I just wasn't satisfied at all with my work. And um, I remember thinking to myself back in the hospital, if I'm, when I woke up, if I am coming back and I'm gonna do this thing called life, I'm gonna do it my way. And decided that I wasn't doing it my way because I wasn't happy where I was working. And so I actually went in and left that, that position. I quit that job and started doing job hunts. And I literally took about four or five different jobs hunting down what I thought would give me a heart connection and stayed about three or four months at each place. And it just wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling me and it wasn't doing the job. And um, I found, I saw an advertisement for the company that I'm working for now. And it was actually just a brief blip. It wasn't the company. It was their, uh, the people who are, were hiring for them who did that. And they had asked that you send a resume in. And um, I actually went I hand delivered my resume and said, I saw this ad and I'm perfect for this position, I'm sure of it, and handed her the resume. And she looked at it and said, well, you just might be. And we'll set, she set up a time for us to meet. And uh, then I noticed the position had been taken out of where it was advertised. And so I called the girl and she said, well, they actually removed it. They're fine tuning it and they uh, aren't sure when they're going to at listed again and I kept on looking for a job but I kept my eye open for that and as soon as they listed it again I was working in another place and I went back and said here's my resume I'm perfect for this position and so they tested me and they sent me on an interview there and uh, I had a couple interviews and uh, it turned out to be a perfect match and I've been there now four years so I, I really sought out a job 
that I could work at because I'm still in a position where I need to make money, where I can get a heart-to-heart connection or make a difference, trying to make a difference in my everyday work world that I have to go to. Do you feel comfortable just talking a little bit about your work? Because I know by what you've explained, it's going to put a big question mark in the viewer's head, like, well, what does she do? Sure. One of the things that I do is I work in basically funeral planning, and I do several different things in this job. I talk to people who have had recent losses. Uh, I also do a little customer service for funeral homes because sometimes mistakes have happened or not necessarily a mistake, but what a family feels to be a mistake. And then I just uh, listen to them and try to help them move through that pain um, and try to make a difference so that uh, other people who are actually you know, getting ready to pass on, their families aren't left with trying to make all the arrangements when they don't know what it is that the parents or their loved one wanted. Do you have any advice to, to say, somebody that's been through a near-death experience? You know, I had the opportunity to be a part of a training group several years ago. And in that group was a Vietnam vet who nobody wanted to get partnered up with him. And so I volunteered to get partnered up with him. And I told him my story. And he said to me, it has been 30 years since my experience, and I have never shared it with anyone. And because he had such a profound experience and it affected him in so many ways. He literally pushed everybody in his life out or they pushed him out. So he spent 20 something years totally alone. And I think that I was at that class to try to teach them something. And I learned the biggest lesson that there was, which is to do share this and not to hold it in because there are so many people who have had these experiences that can help you make the connection so that you're not alone and you're not thinking that there's something wrong with you and that you're crazy and that you're never going to be normal. And because as far as I'm concerned, I am normal. (laughs) I am the normal. So for me, it's just get help, go online, find somebody that you can sit down and share your experience with that would say, I believe that that happened. And that happened to me too. If you could tell family members of people that had a near-death experience, like something, is there any opinion you would have? I don't know what I would tell other families. I can tell you that this is what I told my family. I said to some of my family members, I know that you don't believe that I had this experience and that we have to agree to disagree. But it is hurtful when you belittle me or make me feel like there's something wrong with me. So if we can find some kind of a common ground to allow me to still be who I am and you can be who you are. The only other question I have is, if you heard of this IONS having a goal too for the medical profession to become aware of this, if the IONS goal was met and medical professionals were educated on near-death experience, how do you think they might help somebody? Like put yourself back in when you had just had a near-death experience. If you tried to talk to a doctor, was there any way that they could have helped you at that time or...? Well, I know that I have been in the room of people who are in comas, and I've had the medical profession say to me, doctors, nurses, that I was being unrealistic because these people weren't going to make it. This person in particular was going to die, and I was making my daughter think that there was a chance her father was going to live, and he did live. And I actually tried to have them eat their words because I reminded them that they had told me they never saw anybody that sick live. I think 
if the medical profession would learn anything, they would learn to stop worrying about themselves and are they going to get sued and quit being so negative. People don't die as many times as the doctors say you're going to die. People make it back when there doesn't look like there is absolutely any hope. And they come back and they wake up and they're perfectly okay. Or they have some work they have to do to get back to where they were. But I think the medical profession is so negative and they're so worried that they're always saying this person isn't going to make it. They're always putting the negative twist on it instead of putting a positive twist on it. And I think that if the medical profession could put more of a positive twist on it, that more people would believe and there wouldn't be so much listening to the doctors and dying. I, I personally believe that there have been people to pass on because the doctors gave them no hope. So they didn't believe either. Ask a question. Can I? Oh, okay. Oh. Did you cut? Uh, you're you're about 50 years old now, and uh, how do you look forward, or do you look forward to dying? What's well, your view of that? Right. I am 50 years old, and I am not afraid of dying. I don't necessarily know that I look forward to dying, but I am not afraid of dying, and um, I am not afraid when I see other people dying. Speed. Surviving death, scene three, take four. So the type of work that I did before my near-death experience was basically in sales. And what I could say about the type of person I was before my near-death experience had a lot of ego to it. And so sales was uh, a good game for me, and it was all about the money. I wanted to make a lot of money, and I wanted to uh, be the best, and I wanted to rise up that ladder. and. Um, I just was very aggressive and very assertive. And then afterwards, I know you said that you completely changed. I did. I did completely change. And for me, it wasn't so much about the money and it wasn't so much about the game and it wasn't about my ego. Um, it was more about making connections with people and doing something that really mattered and that helped someone else. Um, I talk to people who are very lonely. I talk to people who don't have anybody to talk to. And I talk to people who have had a recent loss. And so um, for a minute or two in a day, I make several of those connections. And it feels to me like that's what I'm supposed to be doing now. And I get a lot of out of that. Surviving death, scene four, take one. So the moments, the few moments leading up to when I died was um, I could hear the machine that was hooked up to me that was beeping. Uh, I guess it was my heart rate that I could hear. Um, there was a nurse standing next to me who actually started to yell at me uh, to stop breathing the way I was breathing. Actually, what was happening is my lungs were filling completely up and I was drowning. At the same time, the doctor was screaming, you need to do this and get it right. The ship is sinking and um, the room was frantic. And then at that moment, I heard the machine crash and it just was this loud noise that I died. And at that moment, they were still working and I was above my body looking down at everything going on. And you felt yourself go farther. I was just up there. 
and I could hear the noise that my soul was making, which was a buzzing noise. And I was just watching everything that they were doing. I was watching them work on me.